Dasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupa Terubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We welcome everyone to our Bhakti Shastri course. We're studying Bhagavad Gita. We're on chapter 18. So I'll just uh, share this screen. Oh, can you make me the host? Our co-host? And then I can share the screen. Yes. Thank you. Everyone can see the the text, the Bhagavad Gita. Yes, Maharaj, I can see. Okay, good. So do you remember how we were discussing the different sections in the Bhagavad Gita? This eighteenth chapter is like a summary of the Bhagavad Gita. Just like the second chapter was a summary, the second chapter contained uh, Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga and a little trace of Bhakti Yoga. So, so here in the 18th chapter, Lord Krishna is summarizing the teachings. Of course, the, the chapter began with a question by Arjuna. Arjun, Arjuna wanted to know about what is sannyas and what is tyag and is there a difference so lord krishna explains that, that actually sannyas and tyag sannyas is to give up fruit of work give up all kinds of fruit of work and tyag is to renounce the fruits of activities. And then Lord Krishna also went on to describe how sacrifice, charity and penance should never be given up and they should be done out of duty without attachment to the results. So that first section was describing karma yoga, right? The first 12 verses actually were all dealing with karma yoga yoga in action and how by yoga in action we can come to bhakti then after describing karma yoga lord krishna then went on to describe about different causes of action and he described there are five causes of action and he explained that uh, the five causes and the ultimate cause of action is the super soul the other factors being the senses, the endeavour, the body and the soul. And then Lord Krishna was describing about the nature, the three modes of nature and how we're all entangled in the three modes of nature and the different factors which influence our activities are also influenced by the modes of nature. We spoke about knowledge in the modes of nature and we spoke about action in the modes of nature. Right? 
action and knowledge are all influenced by the modes of nature. And now verse 25 begins speaking about action, that action is also in the modes of nature. There is action in goodness and in passion and in ignorance. All right, so uh, we'll begin from this point. Uh, action and passion, that's action and goodness. 23 was action and goodness, action and goodness. 24 was action and passion, and 25 was action and ignorance. Action and ignorance, performed in illusion, disregard of scriptural injunctions, without concern for future bondage, or for violence or distress caused to others is in the mode of ignorance. So it's not that all action is the same or all knowledge is the same. Okay, there's a, it's going to be influenced depending on the modes of nature. This was described in the, 20th, in the, in the 17th chapter. When Arjuna asked his question about people who worship with faith but without any scripture. So Lord Krishna described then that that is faith in the modes of nature. Mm. Actually, we have a diagram of that. Uh, anyway, we'll show you later. Let's go ahead. Mm -mm. All right, so 26, performs his duty, the worker, a worker in the mode of goodness. How does, how will one work, work in the mode of goodness? He performs his duty without association with the modes of nature. That's very good, eh? that he's, he's transcendental. He's not influenced by the modes, modes of nature. He's no false ego. And his great determination and enthusiasm, without wavering in success or failure, this is the worker in the mode of goodness. How rare it is to get somebody like that, who could be in that kind of consciousness, determined and enthusiastic, not affected by success or failure. We're so easily disturbed by the results. Then 27 describes a worker in the mode of passion, who is greedy, envious, impure, and moved by joy and sorrow. <laughs> so, big difference, you see. Worker in the mode of passion. He's attached to work, and he very much wants to enjoy the fruit of the work. That's very important to him. Then 28 goes on to describe the worker in the mode of ignorance. Always engaged in work against the injunction of the scriptures. Just the opposite from the mode of goodness. In mode of goodness, he follows scripture. Mode of ignorance, he doesn't. He doesn't care about scriptures. He does whatever he wants. He's materialistic, obstinate, cheating expert in insulting others, he's lazy, morose, and always procrastinating. So this is a worker in the mode of ignorance, procrastinating. I mean, he's always complaining about this and that. He's got so many excuses for what he, why he can't do the work quickly. It will take so long to do everything. So this is the nature of the worker in the mode of ignorance. And we certainly don't want to be that kind of worker. But unfortunately, there are a lot of people like that. They're very expert in insulting others. You see, that, that's offensive, to insult others. We want to see the good qualities in others and see our own faults. But the nature of the mode of ignorance, you want to you find the faults in others and complain about everybody else. You never see any faults in your own self. 
29 goes on to describe uh, uh, another topic. After leaving aside the worker, now Krishna, Lord Krishna is going to speak about different kinds of understanding and determination. Understanding and determination are also influenced by the modes of nature. We may think, oh, that person is very determined, but his determination may be in the mode of ignorance or it may be in the mode of passion. It's not necessarily in the mode of goodness. And similarly with understanding, understanding can also be goodness, passion or ignorance. So Lord Krishna is kindly revealing to us what is this understanding in the modes. Text number 30. Would someone like to read translation? Text number 30. Yes, Maharaj. O son of Prita, that understanding by which one knows what ought to be done and what ought not to be done, what is to be feared and what is not to be feared, what is binding and what is liberating, is in the mode of goodness. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. So, you can see, he knows what is to be done and what is not to be done. How does he know? Because he's guided by scriptures or he's guided by authorities. He knows what is to be feared and what is not to be feared. Sometimes Prabhupada would say about the devotees, he would say to us, he said, the, pro the problem with the, you, your devotees is, you're not afraid enough of Maya. <laughs> you're not afraid enough of Maya, Prabhupada would say. <laughs> so here it says, he knows what is to be feared and what is not to be feared. And some things we have to be fearful of, some things not. He knows what is binding and what is liberating. That is the mode of goodness. Are you hearing me okay? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. It cut, cut off just like one second, but then... Okay, then... came back in. Yeah? Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number 31 describes action, uh, the worker in the mode of passion. Someone please read. distinguish between religion and irreligion, between action that should be done and action that should not be done, is in the mode of passion. Mm -hmm. So they don't know. They don't know what's religion or irreligion. Means they don't, they don't have good authorities or they don't read the scriptures. They just act according to their own mind, their own senses. They're not properly guided. Then text 32, describing the worker in the mode of ignorance. Oh, under, understanding rather, understanding in the mode of ignorance. That understanding which considers the religion to be religion and religion to be irreligion under the spell of illusion and darkness and strives always in the wrong direction part is in the mode of ignorance. Thank you, Prabhu. So this is the mode of ignorance. Everything is different from how we see it. They're thinking religion, we're thinking irreligion. They're thinking good, we're thinking maya. So they're always in the wrong direction. We've got everything the wrong way around. Prabhupada explains in the purport, intelligence in the mode of ignorance is always working the opposite way it should. It accepts religions which are not actually religions and rejects actual religion. Men in ignorance understand a great soul to be a common man and accept a common man as a great soul. They think truth to be untruth 
and accept untruth as truth. In all activities they simply take the wrong path. Therefore, their intelligence is in the mode of ignorance. All right, now determination is described. Text 33, please read. O son of Pratha, that determination which is unbreakable, which is situated with steadfastness by yoga practice, and which thus controls the activities of the mind, life and senses, is determination in the mode of goodness. Mm. Read the purport, Maharaji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yoga is a means to understand the super soul. One who is steadily fixed in the supreme soul with determination, concentrating one's mind, life and sensory activities on the supreme, engages in Krishna consciousness. That sort of determination is in the mode of goodness. The word avyabhicharin charinya is very significant for it indicates that persons who are engaged in Krishna consciousness are never deviated by any other activity. So this is, this is a, a very good qualification if one can be so fixed that they're not deviated by any other activity. You see, it takes a lot of determination to have that kind of control over the mind and senses. And you have to be really fixed, really st very strong in your determination. So Lord Krishna describes un that determination which is unbreakable. You know, we, we have determination, but it's, it's easily broken, we easily get diverted. It's sustained by steadfast, with steadfastness by yoga practice, and which thus controls the activities of the mind, life and senses. So controlling the mind and the senses is such a great challenge. You have to be very determined, very strong determination. And we can get that kind of determination just by practicing bhakti yoga. We chant the holy name of Krishna. And you re if you make a program to regularly chant and to practice every morning to do bhakti yoga, engaging your mind in the service of Krishna, then it gives you more and more determination. Your determination will become stronger and stronger. And that's what we want for devotional service. We have to be very fixed and determined. Right? Go ahead. Somebody can read next one. De text 34. <coughs> determination in the mode of passion. But that determination by which one holds cause to fruitive results in religion economic development and sense gratification is of the nature of passion. Go Arjuna. Read the purport, Prabhu. Any person who is always desirous of fruitive results in religious or economic and whose mind, life and senses are thus engaged in the mode of passion. Okay, thank you. So the mode of passion, material desires are there, you can see. He's always desirous of some results. He wants sense gratification. It's the mode of passion. And then determination in the mode of ignorance, text 35. Someone like to read? And that determination which cannot go beyond dreaming, fearfulness, lamentation, moroseness, and illusion. Such unintelligent determination, O son of Pritha, is in the mode of darkness. Just go ahead, read the purport. It should not be concluded that a person in the mode of goodness does not dream. Here dream means too much sleep. Dreaming is always present, either in the mode of goodness, passion, or ignorance. Dreaming is a natural occurrence, but those who cannot avoid oversleeping, who cannot avoid the pride of enjoying material objects, who are always dreaming of lauding it 
over the material world and whose life, mind and senses are thus engaged or considered to have determination in the mode of ignorance. Hare Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada talks about dreaming. <laughs> this is part of the, the mode of darkness or mode of ignorance. Their determination cannot go beyond dreaming. There's the daydream and the night dream. <laughs> right? Daydreaming, people have so many illusions, what they want to do, what they want to achieve, their material desires for their sense gratification. So it's a so many dreams, they dream about lording over the material nature and exploiting all the resources of the world for their own pleasure. So many dreams, just the mode of ignorance. Along with the dreaming, there's lamentation, fearfulness, morose, illusion, all of not very pleasant, nothing very nothing to attract us. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, Lord Krishna is now going to speak about happiness, three different kinds of happiness. It's very important for us to understand how there's different kinds of happiness, right? We know from the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna spoke about the, the higher taste the higher taste, you know, param jisvar nivartate. So there's different levels of happiness. There's happiness in ignorance, happiness which is like the dogs and hogs, and there's happiness in passion, and there's happiness in goodness. Different levels of happiness. And they're described here for us in the Bhagavad Gita. Right? So, where are we? Text number... 36. Uh, best of the Bharatas, please hear from me about three kinds of happiness by which the conditioned soul enjoys and by which he sometimes comes to the end of all distress. Right? So 37 describes first of all happiness and the mode of goodness. Someone please read. That which in the beginning may be just like poison, but at the end is just like nectar, and which awakens one to self-realization is said to be happiness in the mode of goodness. Right? So you can get the, the nature of happiness in the mode of goodness. It's, of course, we've had this explanation before, right? Have you, you, you remember seeing this before? It's very similar. In the nectar of instruction, do you remember, Prabhu? No, Maharaj. You don't remember. You didn't study nectar of instruction. Yes, I studied it. Well, I'm sure you must have seen the example in the nectar of instruction. That in the beginning it's like poison, but gradually it becomes nectar. Somebody else remember? In the holy name. Yes, what's the example Rupa Goswami gives? Like the sugar candy. Um, yes. And the and right. Okay, okay. Right. Okay. Have you heard that before? Very, that's the example. Yes, the sugar candy. The, the person who has jaundice. When he takes sugar candy, it tastes bitter. And so the same way, happiness in the mode of goodness, in the beginning it's bitter. Have you had any experience like that? When you came to Krishna consciousness, something was bitter in the beginning and gradually became nectar? Anybody? What happened? What did you experience? What were you doing? In the beginning, I mean, waking up early was a struggle actually, which, which I'm, I was literally forcing myself, uh, which I didn't really like it, but now it's, it's spontaneous. You want to wake up and you want to stand. Very good. Yes. Right. Wake up in the morning. You're not, we don't, you know, 
We used to go to sleep at the time we devotees get up. We used, to, we used to sleep very late and wake up very late. But becoming devotee, we sleep early and wake up early. So in the beginning, you know, it's not very easy for us. We're not used to it. In the beginning also, to sit in the class and to listen, many people will fall asleep. They don't listen carefully. But gradually they get a taste. If they don't get a taste, they go away. They give up Krishna consciousness. So devotional service is like that. So just like the person with jaundice, he takes sugar candy and it's very bitter. But if he t keeps on taking it, gradually it becomes sweet. So in the same way, happiness in the mode of goodness, in the beginning it is bitter, it's like poison. But gradually, gradually it becomes nectar. So, and uh, Lord Krishna also says that this happiness awakens one to self-realization. It awakens one to self-realization. We, we actually understand our spiritual identity. We become self-realized when we experience this kind of happiness. Srila Prabhupada's purport of text 37. In the pursuit of self-realization, one has to follow many rules and regulations to control the mind and the senses and to concentrate the mind on the self. All these procedures are very difficult, bitter like poison. But if one is successful in following the regulations and comes to the transcendental position, he begins to drink real nectar and he enjoys life. So we hope you can come to that position Tolerate the difficulties in the beginning and gradually experience the nectar and enjoy real life. Now, 38. Happiness in the mode of passion. Please read. That happiness which is derived from contact of the senses with our objects and which appears like nectar at first, but poison at the end, is said to be of the nature of passion. Go ahead, Madhuji. Yes, please. Yeah. A young man and a young woman meet, and the senses drive the young man to see her, to touch her, to have sexual intercourse. In the beginning, this may be very pleasing to the senses, but at the end, or after some time, it becomes just like poison. They are separated, or there is divorce, there is lamentation, there is sorrow etc. Such happiness is always in the mode of passion. Happiness derived from a combination of the senses and the sense objects is always a cause of distress and should be avoided by all means. Happiness derived from a combination of the senses and the sense objects is always a cause of distress. Could you give an example of this, Maharaji? Yes, drinking um, it seems so to some people it seems very pleasant at the beginning or they get some um, sense gratification from it but later it's always causes distress also so many foodstuffs um, you know obviously meat eating but also so many processed foods in the market nowadays and people are suffering so many sicknesses because of these various foodstuffs we see an epidemic of sickness in the world because of um, of, of this bad eating habits with additives and stuff. So um, there, there, there are a few examples. Also the illicit sex industry, obviously, it, it causes endless suffering for people, um, diseases, mental diseases, depression. So it's very obvious what Prabhupada is speaking about. We, we can see it happening in front of us. Are you able to grow some of your own food there on your land? Yes, yes. Yes, we, we, we started that many years ago because we were we were getting sick, so we started growing, um, you know, a tunnel because it's very cold 
out here. Um, we have bad weather, so we got a plastic tunnel and we grow um, just basics for us here. Um, so that we can make soups and you know, stews and, and uh, that's all for, for the Lord. So um, we, we don't take anything from the shops at all because um, it's just poison. It's absolutely poison. Are, are you able to grow in the winter time also? Yeah. You can produce food in the winter time? Um, no, in the winter um, you get some cabbage, maybe some kale, but it's very limited. So we just, well, I, I take seaweed, right? I, you know, Ireland has, we have a very huge seaweed um, uh, growth here. So if you take seaweed, is organic, and there's companies supplying it. So it's incredibly nutritious. So we put it in everything. Se and, um, seaweed. Otherwise, we wait until spring. So, yeah, seaweed. I um, you've heard of carrageen moss. It's, um, it's a very common seaweed. It would have been off the coast of Scotland as well. It was used for centuries to um, nourish people. Uh, in the old days when there was terrible poverty. So they've started using it again. And it's because it's organic, you can boil it, you can make the juice. It's not very tasty, but you can put it in soups and so I know, um, subjis. And it's incredible nutrition and it's organic. So um, you can find ways to do it because if we depend on the regular, um, go, you know, the, the country here, it's, it's really scary what, what people are eating. Where do you get this, where do you get the seaweed from? Well, you can get it online. I usually get it online because it's cheaper, matters because in the shops it's very expensive. They, they get a little bit, it costs six euro. But if you get it online, it costs like a quarter of the price. So um, it's, it's, you can get it. There's an Irish company who do it, and they probably have other companies around the world as well who do it. But there's one here off the coast of Galway who do it. And um, you can get a kilo like for 50 euros, but that's a huge amount of seaweed. It will last like for um, six months. So <laughs> not everybody agrees with it. It's, it's not easy to take, but you get used to it. It's like ne poison at the beginning, but nectar at the end. <laughs> so, um, but we had to, because we were suffering so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, so nature of happiness and the, and the happiness in the mode of passion derives from contact of the senses with the sense objects and it's like nectar at first and poison at the end. And now happiness in the mode of ignorance. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Is this, is this shlok uh, similar to Yehi Sans Prashab Hoga Dukh Yoh Ne Ever Te We can say 5.22 Krishna is repeating the same thing. Uh, Half of the. Well, yeah, because what we're doing here in the 18th chapter, we're summarizing teachings which have been given earlier in other places. So you could, you could, maybe you could find similar verses, yeah. All right, so happiness in the mode of ignorance. Somebody please read for us. Text number 39. Hare Krishna. And that happiness which is blind to self-realization, which is delusion from beginning to end, and which arises from sleep, laziness, and illusion, is said to be of the nature of ignorance. Should I read the purport, Maharaj? You could do. Yes, Maharaj. One who takes pleasure in laziness and in sleep is certainly in the mode of darkness, ignorance. And one who has no idea how to act and how not to act is also in the mode of ignorance. For the person in the mode of ignorance, everything is illusion. There is no happiness either in the beginning or at the end. For the person in the mode of passion, there might be some kind of ephemeral happy, happiness in the beginning and at the end distress, but for the person in the mode of ignorance, there is only distress, both in the beginning and at the end. Thank you. So happiness in the mode of ignorance is described that it's blind to self-realization. It is delusion from beginning to end, and it arises from sleep, laziness, and illusion. So five different items are given here to describe the mode of happiness and the mode of ignorance. 
So, quite a lot to remember there. All right, we'll go ahead. Uh, next, we're going to hear about text number 40. There is no being existing, either here or among the demigods in the higher planetary systems, which are freed from these three modes born of material nature. So we can understand that even in the higher planets, they have the three modes of material nature. So, <laughs> very difficult to get, to come to that transcendental platform, to actually get free from the material nature. This material nature, remember, this is Krishna's energy. So very difficult to overcome. Earlier, seventh chapter, Krishna said, Daivihesha gunamai mama maya durakyaya. This material nature is very difficult to overcome. Mameva ye prapajante mayamitam tarantite. One who surrenders to me can easily cross beyond it. So even the demigods are affected. The demigods, they're predominantly in the mode of goodness, but they're also influenced by passion and sometimes ignorance. We know sometimes Indra has problems, sometimes Indra becomes lusty. Because he's surrounded by so many attractive women, sometimes he will have problems. So even in the higher planets, this effect, this tendency to be controlled by the modes of nature is there. So how careful we have to be in everything, these modes of nature are active. All right, so now we're going to hear about the different varnas and the different duties which are performed by these different varnas. Because by working in the varna, then one can come to karma yoga. By performing one's prescribed duty, it will help one to, to perform what is called karma yoga. And karma yoga is purifying. It helps one to get free from sinful reactions. So, there are four varnas. The brahmanas, generally they're considered to be the symbol of the mode of goodness. And they represent the head in the social body. And the kshatriyas are like the arms in the social body. They're meant to give protection to others. The brahmanas are the head because they're meant to guide. They're meant to give instructions for the material and spiritual benefit of the population. And the Kshatriya's duty is to implement the instructions of the Brahmanas and to give protection to people, to protect them from, uh, from, the, from the thieves and the dacoits. So Kshatriyas are like the arms. We, we use our arms to protect ourselves. And the Vaishya, his job is producing food. He's the belly. So the Kshatriya is the mode of passion, and the Vaishya makes passion and ignorance, and the Sudra is the worker, and Sudra is the mode of ignorance. So the Vaishyas, they're, they're producing the food, do the business, banking, and like that. And the Sudras, they're just working. They're the workers. They do what they're told. They're told to work, do this, do that. They have to be told. They don't have proper intelligence to know how to act and what should be done. So they're, they're told by others. So the Brahman, the Kshatriya, Vaishya, they're the higher class, higher caste. So text 42 gives us the qualities of the Brahmana. I think this is a, a, a memorization verse for everyone, an important verse. Samotamas tapas socham shantir arjavam evacha. Jnanam vijnanam astikyam brahma karma svabhavajam. Nine qualities are mentioned because the brahmana is the head. So he has to be the most qualified. 
and begins with peacefulness and then self-control. They have to, Brahmana must control the mind and senses. They should be peaceful, their mind should be peaceful. They shouldn't be agitated. They shouldn't be greedy to get more. They should be peaceful and satisfied. You have to be satisfied to be peaceful. It's important. If they think, oh, I'm very poor, I need more money, then it's not good. Then peacefulness, self-control, austerity. Austerity. We spoke about, well, earlier we spoke about austerity of the body, mind and words, right? Who remembers? What is austerity of the body? Yes, and worshipping the Supreme Lord. Yes, Lord. That's the austerity of the body. What about austerity of the mind? In uh, speaking words which are, uh, which are uh, pleasing, not agitating to others, beneficial, and regularly reciting Vedic literature. Can somebody else tell me what are austerity in speaking? Yes, very good. Thank you. Yes. So austerity like that. And then purity. The Brahman, there'll be, uh, the word is uh, socham. Sometimes we, we would say cleanliness. Brahmins are very clean. They're very particular. They will take bath three times a day or twice a day. Usually it said sannyasi should take bath three times a day, grihastha should bathe twice a day, and the brahmachari, he can bathe once a day. Anyway, brahmanas, their, their nature is to keep everything neat and clean. Uh, Prabhupada would come to visit the temples, he would like to go around the temple and he would look to see if everything was clean. He was very particular about his own room also. He w wanted it to be spotlessly clean. And he would look everywhere and he, 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 would, he wouldn't like to see even a speck of dirt. So everything was cleaned every day in the sheets and there were sheets on the floor, they'd be changed every day. Everything was very spotless. Prabhupada liked to see everything very clean. And uh, Prabhupada gave the example he said, because he'd studied chemistry and he'd worked in a chemical firm as a young man. One of his first jobs was working in a chemical firm. So he knew a chemical equation and he quoted the chemical equation. He said, a base plus acid will react. The reaction will give a salt plus water. You know, if you, if you know chemistry, it's a very basic equation in chemistry. A base, sodium hydroxide plus acid, hydrochloric acid, will give salt, sodium chloride plus water. Base plus acid will react, there will be a reaction, you'll get salt and water. So Prabhupada said the same way, a brahmana, when he contacts a dirty place, he has to clean it. He cannot just simply leave it dirty, he has to clean it. He cannot say, well, I never did it, I didn't do it, it's not my dirt. A brahmana doesn't think like that. The brahmana sees something dirty, he will clean it. So Prabhupada would go around the temple and if he saw things dirty, he would tell the devotees, he would chastise them, keep it clean. We want everything to be kept nicely, take care of it. So this is a quality of the brahmana. And then tolerance, brahmana should be tolerant to tikshiva, right? They tolerate, they will tolerate difficulties, hardships, abuse. And honesty, another important quality of a brahmana, 
Brahmanas don't like to lie and cheat. They would like to be truthful. Prabhupada tells a story about the young boy who wanted to get admission into the school, into the ashram. He wanted to get some education. And so there was the ashram, he went to the ashram head and he asked the ashram head could he become a student there. So the person in charge of the ashram asked him, who's your father? So the boy said, well, I don't know. So they, they told him, then go and ask your mother and find out who your father is and come back and tell us. So he went to see his mother and asked his mother, what's my father's name? And the mother said, I don't know. So the boy came back and he met the head teacher. The head teacher asked him, did you find out your father's name? And the boy said, my mother doesn't know who is my father. So the teacher said, oh, okay, you can become a student in our school. You are honest. You know, most people, if the mother didn't know who is their father, who is the father of their child, they're, they're, you know, most people would be ashamed to say such a thing, that my mother was so uncultured, low-class woman, that she doesn't know even who is my father. But this boy was so simple and straightforward, he didn't hide anything. He told the truth. And that's an important quality, that he didn't try to hide the truth. So that honesty got him a place in the school because the teacher thought, this boy's honest. He can be trained. He can be trained. It's important. Prabhupada told a number of stories about these kind of things. He told another story about there was a job and people were going for the interview. So there were two men. It was between two men who should get the job. So the one man came and he was more qualified educationally. He had the better qualification education-wise. But when he came in, he didn't close the door. When he went out, he didn't close the door behind him. So the man who was doing the interview noticed it, that this person doesn't close the door. But when the other man came in, he closed the door. He was not so qualified materially. His education was not as good as the first man, but he closed the door. He closed the door behind him when he came in and he closed the door when he went out. So the man who, the, the manager who was giving the job, he said, this second man, although he's not so well qualified, he is better because he closes the door. This means that he can be trained. He said that this man can be trained. The other man will be more difficult to train because he doesn't close the doors behind him. <laughs> so Prabhupada gave this example about... Uh, <laughs> understanding people's natures by their habits, by their activities. So Brahmins are very particular, they're very honest, they're tolerant, they're pure, austere, and they have knowledge. That's another important quality of a Brahmin, that generally Brahmins should know something. They should study the scriptures, because people who are Brahmins are meant to work like a Brahmin. And Brahmins are not supposed to work in a job. They're not supp supposed to take a job working for people. They can teach whatever they know. Just like Dronacharya. Dronacharya was a Brahmin and he taught the military arts. He taught the sons of Dhritarashtra and he taught the sons of Pandu. He was their guru. He taught them all the military arts because Dronacharya knew this, he knew how to fight, he knew how to use all the weapons. And he, of course he gave the blessing to Arjuna that he would be his best student, he would be the greatest archer. And Arjuna won the hand of Draupadi like that in the archery contest. And so Dronacharya had trained them as a Brahman, he trained them in the military arts. But generally the Brahmanas will teach the scriptures, and they'll teach to worship the deities. 
and the Brahmana will also worship the deity and they will also teach the scriptures. They will read the scriptures and they will worship the deities themselves. But they will also teach others to do these things. And Brahmanas can also accept charity and they can give charity. And it's said in the Kali Yuga, Brahmanas are very expert in only one of these six activities. Which one do you think they're expert at? Accepting charity. Right. Yes. Yeah. They're very good at taking charity. The other things they don't care about. So this is Kali Yuga. So nine qualities for the Brahmana. Very important. People who are Brahmins should work like a Brahmin. It's not enough just to be born a Brahmin. You have to work like a Brahmin. We, we will see later on, people uh, may have the Brahminical nature, but they don't work like a Brahmin. They take a job. We see many temples. There are many temples around India, and they have no priest. They have no pujari. Nobody wants to do the puja. Where are the Brahmins? Oh, all the Brahmins have gone to the city, they're working in the office, they've taken up some job somewhere. Sudra work. They're supposed to be Brahmins, but they're doing Sudra work. So who can become a Brahmana? Anyone can become a Brahmana. Sanatana Goswami states a verse which says that anybody can become a Brahmana if they're properly initiated and trained then they can develop the Brahminical qualities. The problem is not everyone wants to be trained as a Brahmana. People are only thinking they want to get money. They don't think about Brahminical qualities. They don't think about developing the good qualities. They don't want to worship deities. They just want to go, sit in movies and watch movies, Bollywood movies and things. All right, so this is the nine qualities of the Brahman. And then 43 describes the qualities of the Kshatriya. Someone can read 43? Heroism, power determination, resourcefulness, courage in battle, generosity and leadership are the natural qualities of work for the Kshatriya. So seven qualities for the Kshatriya, nine for the Brahman, seven for the Kshatriya. Particularly we should note qualities like generosity, the Kshatriya, a real Kshatriya will be very generous. Whatever he has, he will give it to, he can give it to others. Can you think of an example from the scriptures about Kshatriyas, how they gave away something for the benefit of others? Anyone? May I speak, Maharaj? Who? Uh, Ranti Dev. What did he do? He was just giving everything he had. Uh, he was fasting and in the last Brahma Vishnu Mahesh came to check him and test him. And they gave him the form of a dog and a beggar and like that. And he, he gave whatever he had, a few, few chapatis and water also he gave away. Okay. They were very peaceful. Yes, Maharaj Ranti Dev. Very generous. Anybody else? Another person? Very generous? Maharaj Harisutta. Who? Uh, um, Harisutta Maharaj. What did he do? Uh, so, uh, Maharaj Harisutta uh, was dream about uh, give charity to the Rishi and next day the Rishi come and, uh, and the Rishi asked uh, uh, the Maharaja to give all the uh, all the wealth to the Rishi and because uh, uh, because uh, Maharaja Harishita know about that so they they give all to the Rishi and and uh, not keep one thing like that. Okay, I don't know where this is told. Where is it told? Oh, she, she, she talking about Harishchandra. Oh, oh Harishchandra. Harishchandra Maharaj. Oh, okay, yes, yes. Harishchandra. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. 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 Hare Krishna Maharaj
Krishna Maharaj, uh, you can give the example of Parikshit Maharaj and also uh, Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj, yeah, he was very generous. He gave charity to who? To uh, Vamandev. To Vamandev. Brahmana. Right. Yes. Yes. And why do you say Parikshit Maharaj? Parikshit Maharaj, he was even very kind to Kali, you know, uh, uh, and he, he was, he protected the cows and dharma also. Mm. He protected all beings, basically, uh, the praja of his country. He was protective about them and that is why he was against Kali. But even when Kali did not find any shelter, he gave shelter, uh, Mother, he gave shelter to Kali uh, on his head itself. Yes, because Kali has surrendered to him. Yes. Okay, yes. And another quality here of Kshatriya is this uh, leadership, or what is called Ishwara Bhav. They have that natural ability to, to control and to, to lead others by their wonderful example, by their power, and by their determination and their heroism. They're not afraid. They're full of courage. It's described in Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was with some devotees and there were some brahmanas and, from Bengal and there was some Rajput, there was this Rajput and then the, these Muslims all came and the Lord Chaitanya had somehow he'd gone into ecstasy and he was unconscious and the, the Muslims came and they thought, they started to accuse these people, the Bengalis and the, they accused them that you've given this man some poison, you've done something to this holy man because Lord Chaitanya was unconscious. So the Bengalis, they were trembling. But the Rajput, he was very brave, you know, because it's a different nature, you know. The Bengalis are a little small and weak, but the, the Rajput's a powerful, built, strong guy. And he wasn't intimidated. He wasn't intimidated. He wasn't afraid of them. So Ishwara Bhav, the Kshatriyas, they have that Ishwara Bhav. We see when Lord Krishna went with Bhima and Arjuna, they went to see Jarasandha and they disguised themselves as Brahmanas. They went to see Jarasandha to beg charity from Jarasandha because Maharaj Yudhisthira needed to perform the Rajasuya sacrifice and they had to have submission from all the kings. So Jarasandha was opposing. So Lord Krishna went with Bhima and Arjuna to see Jarasandha and they disguised themselves as brahmanas so that they could beg charity from him. So Jarasandha was looking at them and he was surprised and said, what kind of brahmanas are these? Because they're so powerful. When just hearing their voices, their voice, it, it says their voices were like thunder. <laughs> like thunder, you know. So they, they have that power, that Ishwara Bhav, that when they speak, it really... Uh, it, it puts people under their control. They have that power to uh, control people just by their words. So Kshatriyas have that kind of quality. And so Arjuna and Bhima, they, had, they were like that. All right, then 44 describes the Vaisha and the Sudra. Someone like to read? Farming, cow protection, and business are the natural work for the Vaishya, and for the Sudras, they are labor and service to others. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Mm. So, cow protection and farming. Lord Krishna, of course, he plays the flute. He's protecting the cows. And Lord Balaram, he has a plow. He's doing farming. And so, they come in the role of the Vaishya, Take birth, they appear in the family of Nanda Maharaj in Vrindavan to show that this is a very pious profession, the most pious profession, to do farming and to protect the cows, very, very important for the welfare of the planet. 
interesting. We were just hearing the lady in Ireland say how every, the food produced there is all poisonous and so many chemicals. And they, they like, people like to grow their own food rather than purchase the things in the market because it's all so polluted with chemicals and processing, not nutritious, not healthy. So farming very important, it's the most pious profession and then protecting the cows very important for our, the welfare of the whole planet. And banking and business also has to go on, important. And the sudras, their job is to labour and serve others. So these are the four varnas. So then Lord Krishna describes, by following his qualities of work, every man can become perfect. Now please hear from me how this can be done. Right? Just by following the qualities of work, everyone can become perfect. Do what you're supposed to do. Would someone like to read the next verse, 46? Hare Krishna, by worshipping of the Lord, who is the source of all beings and who is all providing, a man can attain perfection to performing his own work. Shall I continue? Yeah, please. As stated in the 15th chapter, all living beings are fragmental part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. Thus the Supreme Lord is the beginning of all living entity. This is confirmed in the Veda Sutra, Janmadi Asharya Taha. The Supreme Lord is therefore the beginning of life of every living entity. And as stated in the seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Lord, by his two energies, his ex external energies and internal energy, is all pervading, therefore, one should worship the Supreme Lord with his energies. Generally, the Vaisnava devotees worship the Supreme Lord with his internal energy. His external energy is the perverted reflection of the internal energy. The external energy is the background, but the Supreme Lord, by the expansion of his plenary portion as Paramatma, is situated everywhere. He is the super soul of the all demigods, all human beings, all animals, everywhere. Wants to therefore know that as part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, one has his duty to render service unto the Supreme. Everyone should be engaged in devotional service to the Lord in full Krishna consciousness. That is recommended in this verse. Go ahead. Everyone should think that he is engaged in a particular type of occupation by Rasikas, the master of their senses, and by the result of the work in which one is engaged. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, should be worshipped. If one thinks always in this way, in full Krishna consciousness, then by the grace of the Lord, he becomes fully aware of everything. That is the perfection of life. The Lord says in Bhagavad Gita 12.7, Tesam Aham Samudra Darta. The Supreme Lord himself takes charge of delivering such a devotee. That is the highest perfection of life. In the wor whatever occupation one may be engaged, if he ser serves the Supreme Lord, he will achieve the highest perfection. So just simply by doing service for the Lord, according to our situation in the Varnashram, if we follow, if we do our duty, we, what we're supposed to do uh, according to our position in the Varnashram, and we offer the results of that work for the service of Krishna, then we can achieve the highest perfection. It's not that we have to, we can only, it's not that you have to do this, not that you have to be in a temple, not that you have to be a sannyasi or anything, but anyone in any situation, 
if they offer the results of their work, if they do it for the service, for the pleasure of the Lord, then that is Krishna consciousness and that can give them the perfection of life. They don't have to change their situation. Lord Chaitanya taught everyone, just stay where you are, stay in whatever position you're in. If you're a, a, a family man, stay a family man. If you're a Vaishya, stay a Vaishya. You don't need to change your position. Just stay, just add the chanting of Hare Krishna and hear about Krishna. If we do, and whatever work we do, we give the results for Krishna. So that is very pleasing to Lord Krishna when he sees someone give the results of his work. Right? The next text, text number 47. Who would like to read? Thank you, Maharaj. Yes. It is better to engage in one own occupation, even though one may perform it imperfectly, than to accept another's occupation and perform it perfectly. Duties prescribed according to one's nature are never affected by sinful reaction. Shall I read the purport also, Maharaj? Yeah, we can try to read it. Go ahead. Yeah, purport. One, one's occupational duty is prescribed in the Bhagavad Gita, as already discussed in the previous verses. The duty of Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Sudras are prescribed according to their particular modes of nature. One should not intimate another's duty. A man who is by nature attracted to the kind of work done by Sudra should not artificially claim to be a Brahmana, although he may have been born into a Brahmana family. In this way, one should work according to his own nature. No work is abdominal if performed in the service of the Supreme Lord. The occupational duty of Brahmana is certainly in a mood of goodness, but if a person is not by nature in the mood of goodness, he should not imitate that the administrator there are so many abominable things. A Kshatriya has to be violent to kill his enemies and sometimes a Kshatriya has to tell lies for the sake of diplomacy. Such violence and duplicity accompany political affairs, but a Kshatriya is not supposed to give up his occupational duty and try to perform the duties of a Brahmana. Okay, so we, we can see here um, Prabhupada is describing this because Arjuna may be thinking that he would like to give up his duty because he knows that to fight in the battle he will have to kill people. As a Kshatriya he's going to be fighting and killing people so he doesn't like to do that. But the Kshatriya should accept that this is his occupational duty. And he shouldn't try to become a brahmana. Remember, Arjuna was thinking that he should go and do begging. But Krishna didn't want him to do that. Krishna doesn't want him to just... He said, that's not your nature. So we have to recognize the psychophysical nature of everyone. Arjuna's nature was a kshatriya. And the kshatriyas, they, they cannot just go and beg. Their duty is to fight. Although in this particular situation, before the battle, Arjuna was thinking it's not a good idea to fight. But Krishna encourages him that this is your duty. And you don't get perfection by giving up your duty and, do, and doing something else. You should stay in your position. And Lord Chaitanya taught everyone, stay in your position and hear about Krishna. So you take up some other person's duty, it's not good. It simply creates some disturbance in the society. People will think, well, why he's doing that? It's not his job. He's not a he's not a Brahmin. Why he's doing that? So, he, but at the same time, Prabhupada recognizes that different people have a they may have a different nature, even though when they may be born in the family of a Brahmana. But their nature is not to be a brahmana. They just want to have a job. They want to work. They want to have steady income working in the company. And they take a job. 
Although their father may be a brahmana, they don't work as a brahmana. They don't want to be the priest in the temple. They don't want to do the pujas. They just want to sit in the office all day and have a job. That's, that's sudra work. Steady work, but it's sudra work. But the brahmana, he will do the different... different but he may do the, the ritual, different pujas, he may do teaching, he may do different things. But some people are not inclined to do that. They want more money. They say, I can get more money working in the company. <laughs> so people don't want to be a brahmana. So in this way temples are suffering, they don't have pujaris, they don't have priests. Or if they do, the priests are unqualified. That's also another thing. Sometimes you get people un who are untrained, who are not properly educated in how to worship the deity, but they come along and worship the deity. So people should be trained, they should be properly educated. Anyone can become a brahmana, but they have to be initiated and trained. It's not that just somebody comes along and says, I want to be a brahmana. They have to be trained, first of all, to become, to develop the Brahman, Brahmanical qualities. So this is important. All right, we'll go ahead. Text number 48. Krishna gives an example in text 48. Someone please read. Every endeavor is covered by some fault. Just as fire is covered by smoke, therefore one should not give up the work born of his nature, O son of Kunti, even if such work is full of fault. So Krishna is giving an interesting example. He said, just like fire is covered by smoke, right? You want to light a fire, in the beginning there's going to be smoke. You cannot really avoid the fact there'll be smoke. And so Krishna compares it in this way, uh, even one, one may be working and his work is not perfect, there may be fault in the work, but don't give it up. Don't think, oh, I, you know, I shouldn't do it, I'm not going to do this work because I can't do it very well. But if it's our nature, if it's our qualification, we should stick with it, we should do it. Right? You shouldn't give up work born of one's own nature. Even if there's fault, you do it anyway. And Krishna gives the example that just like smoke with the fire. Fire is covered by smoke, but still, if you let the fire burn, gradually the fire will burn and you'll get flames. So similarly, in the, we may be doing work, and may be faulty, but if we keep working, gradually the work can improve and we can get rid of the faults. Is it clear? Yeah. I'll read from the purport. If you look at the purport. A very nice example is given herein. Although fire is pure, still there is smoke. Yet smoke does not make the fire impure. Even though there is smoke in the fire, fire is still considered to be the purest of all elements. If one prefers to give up the work of a Kshatriya and take up the occupation of a Brahmana, he is not assured that in the occupation of a Brahmana there are no unpleasant duties. One may then conclude that in the material world no one can be completely free from the contamination of material nature. This example of fire and smoke is very appropriate in this connection. When in winter time one takes a stone from the fire, sometimes smoke disturbs the eyes and other parts of the body. But still, one must make, one must make use of the fire despite disturbing conditions. Okay, we'll go ahead, text number 49, we're going to hear 
about the nature coming to the platform of Brahman, getting free of the modes, right? Becoming self-realized, coming to the platform of Brahman. It takes 49, 40, 49 reads. Please, someone read. One who is self-controlled and unattached and who disregards all material enjoyments can obtain the practice of renunciation, the highest perfect stage of freedom from reaction. Right? So this is this is karma yoga, freedom from reaction. By karma yoga, you, you do your duty, you do the work which you know, you can get free of reactions. Prabhupada writes in the purport, a sannyasi is supposed to be free from the reactions of his past activities, but a person who is in Krishna consciousness automatically attains this perfection without even accepting the so-called order of renunciation. You don't need to become a sannyasi, you see, you can get free just by doing your work. This state of mind is called yoga rutha or the perfectional stage of yoga. It's confirmed in the third chapter. Yastvatma ritir evasyat. One who is satisfied in himself has no fear of any kind of reaction from his activity. Going ahead, text number 50, we're going to hear from the platform of Gyan, we can come to Brahman. Text number 50. All right, go ahead, read text 51 to 53. Being purified by his intelligence and controlling the mind with determination, giving up the objects of sense gratification, being free from attachment and hatred, one who lives in the secluded place, who eats little, who controls his body, mind and power of speech, who is always in trance and who is detached, free from false ego, false strength, false pride, lust, anger, and acceptance of material things, free from false proprietorship and peaceful. Such a person is certainly elevated to the position of self-realization. All right. So Lord Krishna is describing all of these different qualities which would be seen in a person who has actually come to the platform of self-realization, understanding that they're not the body, that they're spirit soul, or you could say that they know, know themselves as Brahman. So Brahman realization is being described. Yes? Brahman realization. Then text 54 goes on to describe Brahman, the platform of Brahman. Text 54, I think that's one of your memorization verses. Is it? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. So everybody knows this verse, right? Brahma Bhutta Prasanatma. If you come to the platform of Brahman, you should be Prasanatma, a joyful soul, fully joyful. Na sochati na kanchati, not no hankering and no lamenting for anything. Sama sarveshu bhuteshu, seeing all living entities equally. And in that state, then you're ready for devotional service. Mad bhaktim labate param. You can come to devotional service from the platform of Brahman. Now the platform of Brahman, we should understand this is higher than the mode of goodness. One who is in the mode of goodness, he's in, on the material platform. And at any time he can fall under the mode of passion and ignorance. 
But Brahman is transcendental. One who's on the platform of Brahman, he's a transcendentalist. So he may be, he may not be a devotee, however. He simply knows he's not the body. He simply understands, I'm not the body, I'm Brahman. So he's, he thinks only, aham brahmasmi, I am spirit soul. But he doesn't understand the nature of the soul. He doesn't understand the connection between the soul and the supreme soul. So there's a difference. The platform of Brahman and one who is actually a devotee. Now for the Mayavadi, for the impersonalist Brahmagyani, their goal is to get to this platform of Brahman. This is what they would call the platform of liberation or mukti, to come to the platform of Brahman. And they're thinking this is the, this is the end. But for a devotee, this is where a devotional service begins. We begin from the platform of Brahman. When you engage in devotional service, we read, we, we heard earlier, mamchayo vayabicharena bhakti yogena sevate sagunam samatijaikam brahma bhuyaya kaupate. When we engage in devotional service, we immediately come to the level of Brahman. So we begin from the level of Brahman. The, the Brahmagyanis, the Vedantas, the Gyanis, they're struggling to come to the level of Brahman. But our devotion begins from the platform of Brahman. But we go on from there. We want to develop our love for Krishna. We don't just simply want to know Brahman. We want to know the Supreme Brahman, to know Krishna. Is it clear, everyone? Any questions? No question. Yes, ask the question now from East. Uh, please accept my obeisances, Maharaj. Uh, so, Maharaj, we are not in the liberated state, we are not Brahman realized, so are we not uh, doing devotional service? You're not on the liberated stage. You can, you can become liberated. You just have to do devotional service. When you do devotional service, then you're on the liberated stage. When you chant Hare Krishna, when you do service for Krishna, that is the liberated stage. So you just have to keep engaging in devotional service. Then you're liberated. When we're studying Bhagavad Gita, we're reading Bhagavad Gita, we're studying this Bhagavad Gita, this is a liberated, this is a liberated activity. This is for liberated souls. You may not, you may not know you're liberated, but you're liberated. You just have to keep engaging in devotional service. Then you're liberated. But as soon as you stop serving Krishna, then you fall under the modes of nature. That's a problem. You go under the modes of nature very easily. So to actually become sit, to actually come to the liberated platform, we have to engage in devotional service without falling down. It should be without deviation, without gaps. We have to constantly engage in devotional service. Right? And there has to be that connection to Krishna in all your activities. Everything you do, you do it for Krishna. That is the liberated platform. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj never understood this sloka. I thought that when, when one is that realized, only then he begins, the devotional service begins only after that, when when he realizes that I am not this body but spirit soul. I thought like that. Well, of course, pure devotional service, you know, very pure devotional service begins from the platform of Brahman. But as soon as we engage, you know, when, when we're doing devotional service, 
If we take up devotional service, immediately we are put onto the platform of Brahman. We can do it. We do it if, we're, if the consciousness is there that we're doing it for Krishna, then that is the spiritual platform. Devotional service can also be influenced by the modes of nature. So you just have to be careful that your devotional service, that your attitude is not material. You know, somebody does bhakti yoga and they may do it, uh, they may do it in a lazy manner or a grudging manner, that's the mode of ignorance. And somebody does it, they want to get name and fame, that's the mode of passion. And somebody else does devotional service, they just simply want to get rid of their sins. But the actual mode of pure devotion is that you do it for the pleasure of Krishna. You just want to please Krishna. You're not thinking of what you will get. So that is pure devotion. That is the transcendental platform. And, and that transcendental platform is very easily reached for a devotee. Prabhupada always gave the example about the devotee, they go up the building and in the, in the lift, they take the, the lift up to the top of the building. Other people, they may walk up the stairs, they take a long time to reach the top. But the devotee, they ride in the lift, they get to the top very quickly. So devotional service is like that. You take the lift up. We don't have to go step by step by step, you know, one quality and another quality, no. We're, we just simply take the lift. We chant Hare Krishna, we engage in Krishna's service and quickly we get to the highest platform. We transcend the modes. So we can say that when we are nicely engaged in devotional service, then we are at a liberated platform. Yes. But we have a nature to be affected by the lower modes. Well, as soon as you stop serving Krishna, then the modes will come. Yes. So you have to be careful. You have to be on guard. You have to protect yourself from the Maya, from the lower modes. How do you protect yourself? By having a good sadhana every day. You have to have a good sadhana every day. You do chanting, you do hearing, you study the scriptures and that makes you, gives you strength in Krishna consciousness to fight maya, to fight the tendency for sense gratification. Yes, Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada also said that all my followers or devotees are liberated. So I, this means the same thing. Yes, right. Yes, yes. Thank you, Maharaj. I understood. All right. Any other question? Yes. Uh, I would like to ask regarding the exchanging of uh, Dharma Maharaj or Varna Ashrama. So, as we can see, Lord Krishna is uh, changing from Vaishya and then become uh, uh, Satriya later in the Dwaraka. So, is it Lila Maharaj or anything Lord Krishna wants to exhibit behind that? Thank you, Maharaj. Your question is, is it Krishna who changes the Dharma or the Varna? Yes, Maharaj. Is it something like that or is it just his Leela? Well, it may be it's, it's due to the, the desire. You know, we have to consider that each person may be different. Just like we know uh, Parasuram, he changed his Varna, right? Parasuram was born a Brahmana, but he became a Kshatriya, right? Why? Parasurama became a Kshatriya, he had a service to do, he had to, he had to kill all the other Kshatriyas, all the, so many demoniac Kshatriyas, he killed the Kshatriya race 22 times. So Parasarama, he changed from Brahmana to Kshatriya to do that service because he had to, 
had a function to fulfill. He had to remove all these demonic kshatriyas. And we have the example of Vishwamitra. Vishwamitra was a kshatriya, he became a brahmana. Now, why did Vishwamitra become a brahmana? What did he want? He wanted the brahmanical power. He was attracted. When he saw Vashista, Vashista is so powerful, Vishwamitra was amazed. He, he was a Kshatriya, but this Vashista as a Brahmana was so powerful, much more powerful than uh, Vishwamitra. So Vishwamitra to say he also wanted to become a Brahmana. So he did a lot of austerity and gradually became Brahmana. So it was the, it, you, the individual's desire. Of course, we say anybody can become a Brahmana. You get initiation and training, you can cultivate the Brahminical qualities. For a Brahmana to become a Kshatriya, maybe it's more difficult. <laughs> that special qualities are there required. Of course, Parasaram was not a problem for him. He was very qualified to become a Kshatriya. But time and circumstance will be the impetus in people changing their varnas. We see here in the Kali Yuga, in the Kali Yuga everyone is born sudra or lower by birth, but they can be elevated. Because in this Kali Yuga, it, Prabhupada it, it explains that it's, now it's a, an emergency situation. The emergency is that the brahmanas don't want to preach. Those people who were brahmanas, they give up, they give up their brahmana duties and become sudras and take up jobs. And some people are brahmanas and they, they, they get some money and they open a shop and they want to be a businessman. They'd rather be a businessman, a shopkeeper, than a brahmana. So these kind of problems came up. So because of the emergency, the opportunity to become brahmanas is given to people like myself, who come from a non-Hindu family, from a non-Vedic family, but I get the because of initiation, spiritual initiation, I can be initiated as a brahmana and I can take up the work of a brahmana. It's a special, special facility due to the, the emergency situation. An emergency situation, there's no other qualified people. Therefore it's given to people like me that I can also become like a Brahmana and do Brahmanical duties. Although I don't have the birthright, I don't have any birthright, I don't have the, kar the karma, but by the mercy of the spiritual master, from the training and the mercy of the spiritual master, I can be given that opportunity. All right? Thank you very much, Maharaj. Next is Ibrahim Lekha Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Maharaj, these shlokas are about impersonalists. Which shloka about impersonalists? This, this, this Buddha Vishuddhaya Yukta, 51 to 53. Uh, these look, 51 to 53 are for yeah, but we're talking about Brahman. Who wants to go to the Brahman? Devotees are not interested in Brahman. Of course, uh, people no. go to the Brahman, they're Brahmagyanis or impersonalists. Okay. Yes. So naturally these qualities are like that. Nothing to, nothing to do with devotional service. These qualities are for the impersonalists, the Brahmagyanis, the Vedantists, these kind of people who want to go to the Brahman. Their goal is Mukti, the impersonal Brahman. Mm -hmm. Krishna is taking us from, from this to devotional service. Yes. After coming to Brahman, then we will hear about devotional service. 
in different levels. Yeah, Krishna will explain his this knowledge of Brahman that is confidential knowledge, the knowledge of Paramatma that is more confidential knowledge, and knowledge of Bhagwan is the most confidential knowledge. So we've got that confidential, more confidential, most confidential Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan. You know, I wanted to spend a little time just to go over the questions for the open book with you. I noticed there's a, a mistake in one of them, one of the questions, question number 88 in the student handbook. Question 88, it said, explain the significance of the phrase dharmyam samvadam. And they put 18.7, but it shouldn't be 18.7, it should be 18.70. They missed out the final digit, the zero digit after the seven. It's sloka number 70 of the 18th chapter. All right? So in case you're going, if, in case when you're preparing for the test on Saturday, then you may be trying to find the answer to this question. So question 88, explain the significance of the phrase dharmyam samvadam. It's in sloka number 70 of the 18th chapter. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Mar Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? They changed, the coordinator mentioned that the questions have been changed from this uh, Volume 5 to Volume 4 of Student Handbook. There's oh. only 35 questions there. Oh. oh, really? So, I think because the exam is really short, so the condensed version of the questions usually have short answer uh, questions as opposed to the explanation questions. Oh, okay. Okay. So then you so don't have to... Our exam is just one hour. Okay. Stuff in around 20 questions in there. All right. So you don't have much worry then. It's much easier. Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. So you don't have a problem with all that. Okay, so... We're up to 54, text 54, which brings us up to... questions again, Maharaj? Huh? Do we take more questions or...? Yeah, are there more questions? Yeah, there, there is uh, from uh, Asim Krishna Das and then Archana Bhakti Yadam Maharaj. Okay. Maharaj, I want to ask, sorry, it's two small questions. Uh, Maharaj, I, uh, once you said that the sannyasi is supposed to take bath three times and household two times and a brahmachari one time, so I didn't understand how a brahmachari is supposed to take one time. Well, you can take more if you want. It's not that you can't. It's not that you can only take one time. You're allowed to take more if you want, but you must take at least once. Right? This is the, the Vedic culture. Ved, Vedic... What? Sorry Prabhu, you are very lagging, we could not hear. Should we go on to the next one first? Yeah, you better, yeah. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, I have little uh, difficulty in understanding shloka number 26 where it says, one who performs his duty without association with the modes of material nature. How does one perform, mother, how do you understand this? How does one perform duty without the association of the modes of material nature? Well, in other and words, it says, yes. one should be transcendental. You have to be above the modes of nature. If you're not going to associate with the modes of nature, you should be above them, you should be free from them. 
In other words, you have to you have to come to the transcendental platform. But if you are working uh, from the transcendental platform, then it says that person is in the mode of goodness. That he is coming down from the transcendental uh, platform. Okay. Yeah, but if if you're working in the if you're in the pure mode of goodness, then you've transcended mm -hmm. the modes of nature, right? Yes, Maharaj. So that's the idea. If you come up to the mode of goodness, the idea is that if you stay up on the on the mode of goodness, you get free of passion and ignorance, then you transcend the modes. Because the real modes are coming, the modes are coming that which are giving you trouble, the passion and ignorance. But if you're able to fix yourself in the mode of goodness, and the other qualities are also described, right? What is it? Text 27? 26, Maharaj. 26. Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing that. It says, one who performs his duty without association with the modes of material nature, without false ego, <laughs> <laughs> with great determination and enthusiasm, you see. So it, it's very similar to what we're told in uh, Upadeshamrita. Rupa Goswami mentions, you know, enthusiasm, patience, and determination, and how to advance in devotional service in Krishna consciousness. And the Sanskrit word says, Mukta Sangha, liberated from all material association. So mukta sangha, that means association on the liberated platform. Liberated platform, you could call it the platform of Brahman, you know, that was like that. De detached from the body, not thinking about the results. It says, without wavering in success or failure. So you're not worried about the results. And, mm. you're, you're, and there's no ego there, no false ego. And determined and enthusiastic. So that's, these qualities are there. But at the same time, it says, mukta sangha, material, without material association. material association will be thinking about the results and enjoying the results for our sense gratification. Yes, Maharaj. So Prabhupada has described it like this, as he performs his duty without association with the modes. Now, the, the, the translations, you know, sometimes um, Pankaj, um, Janani Vas Prabhu in Mayapur was telling me, he said that uh, they were reading a Bhagavad Gita and they were reading a verse and, and another devotee was there and he said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, he said, you know, your translation of the verse is the same as the, this Mayavadi translation of the Bhagavad Gita. And he said, the Mayavadi, it's a, it's a Mayavadi, this is a Mayavadi Bhagavad Gita, but you, it's just the same as your translation. And Prabhupada said, yes, translation may be the same, but the difference is in the purport. He said, the Vaishnava commentary, the Vaishnava purport is what makes a difference. So it's Prabhupada's purports which are really, we're really looking to, to understand yes, nice. the verse, right? Yes, we won't understand. So we won't understand so much just from the translation. They're just, you know, trying to put together some words from the, from the Sanskrit. But Prabhupada's purport is very clear, and Prabhupada talks about Krishna consciousness, always transcendental to the modes of nature. So Prabhupada would always bring in. Bhakti, he would always present the bhakti conclusion, the, the commentary in relation to devotional service. So don't get put off by a few words in the, in the translation. The, the real meaning is there in the purport. Mm -hmm. Thank 
Hare Krishna. One who is in Brahma Bhutta, if he's going to take take up devotional service, yes, but if he's already on the platform of Brahman, if he's already come to Brahma Bhutta platform and he's attracted to devotional service, it won't take him much time. Quickly he can progress because he's already come to the Brahma Bhutta platform. So he's already detached from the material world. He's free from passion and ignorance. And he's realized he's not the body, he's detached from the body. So for him, devotional service will be very, the, pro, the, the prog progress will be very rapid. Because he's come to that Brahman platform. And we see people, I've seen people, you know, they become devotees, some people who were Buddhists before or who were doing some kind of yoga, and, you know, they become devotees, they, they can very intensely, they can chant japa so nicely because they're used to doing meditation and used to controlling the mind and senses. They've been trained to control the mind and senses. They're not coming from a hedonistic life of sense gratification. They, they, they've already controlled their mind and senses and then they come to Krishna Consciousness. So quickly they can develop Krishna Consciousness. Like Duryodhana, Jarasandha, Shishupala, get Kshatriya qualities. Well, Kshatriyas can, we know there are many de demonic Kshatriyas on the planet, right? They get, they have the Kshatriya qualities, but they, they use them for their own sense gratification. That is always there. Whatever qualities one may have, you can use it for Krishna or you use it for your own sense gratification. Just like one may be a Brahmin, Brahminical person, he may be qualified as a Brahmin, but not all Brahmins are devotees. We know there are some Brahmins who are very materialistic. They do karmakandi rituals and they simply perform acts for material gain and material benefit. They don't think about devotional service. They know about it, but they, they don't worry about it. They just do things for sense gratification. They're thinking about their business. They're thinking about the money. They're not thinking about the devotion. So, Sukracharya, Sukracharya was a great Brahmana. He was a great guru, but he, he was a guru of the demons. And so Kshatriyas can be good people, they can be bad people. They're not all good. You know, Maharaj Venu, cruel Venu, described in Srimad Bhagavatam. Cruel Venu, he was a Kshatriya, he was very demoniac. He killed so many, he'd play with his young friends, he would kill them. The father was so disappointed that his son was such a demon that the father left home and went to the forest. Just renounced the world. He thought Krishna gave me a demonic son just to help me to be detached from the world. 
And so, yes, there are Kshatriyas who are demons. Sishupal, Kamsa, Dantavarkra, these people, so many Kshatriyas. Krishna killed them. But Krishna was merciful to them. They, when they're killed by Krishna, that's very um, a blessing. Because they're killed by Krishna, they get liberation. All the Kshatriyas who came to die on the battlefield at Kurukshetra, they were blessed. They died in the presence of Krishna. And they could get liberation. They could go to the supreme abode. That's Krishna's blessing on them. And they come, they come to take part in Krishna's Leela. They're not ordinary Kshatriyas. They're, if they're killed by Krishna directly, that means they're very special Kshatriyas. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, how to understand that a Brahmana is Asura, like Shukracharya? Well, everyone has their free will, who you want to associate with, who you want to be with. So Shukracharya, he was attracted to be with the, with the, his, he was always with the demons, his place was there with the demons. Brihaspati is there with the demigods, Sukracharya with the, but Sukracharya is also mentioned in the opulences of the Absolute. Among great thinkers, Krishna says, I am Sukracharya. So Sukracharya is glorified by Krishna in chapter 10, Vibhuti Yoga, he's mentioned there. Although he's guru of the demons, but Krishna appreciates him. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Also, Maharaj, that brahmacharis are comparatively more pure than uh, griyastas or... Uh, can we say that? That's why it's written that he can take bath one time. Uh, just guessing. I don't know where you got this from. Who said brahmacharis are more pure than grihastas? <laughs> where is this? There in the, matlab, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> never I'm never had there. this. <laughs> I was not able to get the reason behind it, so I just guessed. I'm sorry, Maharaj. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Thank you. So the, the last raised hand is Valmiki Prabhu. Please. Hare Krishna, dear Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances and goes to Shla Prabhupada. I would like to ask you about text 47, uh, about it is better to engage in one's own occupation even though one may perform it imperfectly than to accept another's occupation and perform it perfectly. Duties prescribed according to one's nature are never affected by sinful reactions. So in connection with Arjuna, so we learn on the beginning on Bhagavad Gita that uh, Arjuna was soft-hearted person. So and uh, and also we can see in uh, in uh, text forty-two, Shama Dhamma First is Shama, and that is peacefulness. And uh, so how it is possible that uh, that Arjuna play the role of Kshatriya? Although he was peaceful, he, he, he tolerated things, he got knowledge, wisdom, like uh, this is qualifications of Brahmanas. And he, he didn't will to actually uh, be a hero or uh, fight in the battle. And uh, the qualities of a Brahman, uh, Kshatriyas are heroism, power, de determination, uh, cour courage in battle and so on. So, if you can clarify or kindly explain that, uh, you know, something about this. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, well, Arjuna's nature, remember Arjuna's nature, Krishna told him that uh, your nature is to be a warrior, to fight. He said, if you don't fight, if, you know, if you go to, away from the battle, then people will mock you, they will scorn you scorn you, you'll be known as a coward. And what could be more painful for you than that? 
that you've been glorified in the past, people have honoured you and glorified you as being a great fighter and a great hero. But now if you're going to go away from the battle and go begging, they will mock you and they'll scorn you and say you were just a coward. And that will be unbearable to you. To you. For a Kshatriya to be uh, scorned and called a coward, then it's very intolerable. Kshatriya cannot tolerate that. And Krishna understood Arjuna's nature, that I know that, that you, you, you may not want to fight here, but later on you're going to fight, you have to fight. You cannot avoid it. Because you're Kshatriya and you have that blood, it's in your blood to fight. So certainly Arjuna had good qualities because he's a devotee. So he has good qualities, that's why some, we see some of what you say, Brahminical qualities like that. He's not rash, he's not impulsive, he's not passionate that, oh, I'm going to get these people, you know, very rash and get revenge. He wasn't like that. He, want, he wanted to make sure, am I doing the right thing? So he consulted with Krishna, with Lord Krishna. He inquired from Krishna that, is it right? Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I can see so many reasons why I shouldn't fight. So kindly guide me once Krishna, and Krishna took away all the reasons and defeated all Arjuna's arguments and convinced Arjuna that he should do it. Of course, Arjuna understood Lord Krishna's position as the Supreme Lord. And Arjuna knew he was taking instruction from the personality of Godhead. And when Krishna wants Arjuna to fight, then that's the, the, the real reason why Arjuna takes up the fighting that Krishna wants him to do it. And Arjuna is a devotee and he wants to please Krishna. He wants to do what Krishna wants him to do. It's not all the other reasons why he's going to fight, but the real reason why he's going to fight is because Krishna wants him to do it. It was Krishna's desire that he engage in this battle. Therefore, Arjuna took up the mission to fight. Yes, Maharaj. I just uh, couldn't understand that how per a soft-hearted person uh, can fight. So it was. So what? What person? Soft-hearted person. How oh, soft-hearted. Soft-hearted. Well, yes. uh, well, Arjuna is not that. It's not that he's so soft-hearted. You know, he is a Kshatriya, He's a Maharati, and you know, but he's but he's not in the mode of passion or ignorance. He's more transcendental, of course he's transcendentally situated because he's a pure devotee, he's a devotee of Lord Krishna. So when he becomes angry, he has to go, he has to become a little angry to go into the battlefield. And so, you know, he's going to go into battle, some anger is, has to be there. He, and he has that anger within him as a Kshatriya. He can release the anger when it's required. But generally he is kind, a kind-hearted person, he's in the mode of goodness. As a devotee he has all the good qualities. But because he's a devotee, he's surrendered to Krishna and Krishna wants him to fight. So that's why he's going to do it. And, and Arjuna he admits that. You, we will see tomorrow in the, in the next few verses, we will see how Krishna said, yes, I've heard your instructions, now I'm ready to act. I have to do. I have to do it. So Krishna could awaken the anger of Arjuna so that he could fight in the battle. But it's not that Arjuna is just soft-hearted. Okay, okay. So we can, uh, so we can understand uh, also in this, in example that like uh, we, are, we are trying to be transcendentalist uh, de devotees of Krishna, and so um, we can we can do uh, services like uh, what Krishna wants from us, right? Like a shudra work or kshatriya work or brahmanas. Uh, so. We are actually doing what Krishna wants from us. Yes, we, we can do it. What, we can do anything for Lord Krishna. We're willing to work anywhere and do anything for Krishna. 
That's required, yes. Sometimes we have to clean the toilet, sometimes we have to take the garbage out, sometimes we have to worship the deity. We have to do everything for Krishna. We don't want, we don't say, you know, I'm a Brahmana, I can't do this, I only do that, you know. <laughs> then Krishna consciousness will do whatever is required for the pleasure of Krishna. Yes, Maharaj, thank you very much. Just like a devotee told me, they were in the beginning of the movement, they were printing the Back to Godhead magazine, and they had to collate the pages, you know, collect page one and two and put it all together and staple, staple it together. So nobody wanted to do it. So Prabhupada said, I will do it. And Prabhupada went and started, and when Prabhupada went to do it, then all the devotees, okay, okay, I'll come, I'll do it, you know, I'll come and help. <laughs> and so uh, Prabhupada, by his example, was showing the devotees you have to do everything. Another time, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati came to the temple and he saw the garden was all overgrown with weeds and he said, I'll go in the garden, bring me the spade and he began to clean the garden and pull out the weeds and the devotees all came and said, oh no, Guru Maharaj, let us do it, we will do it. So sometimes the spiritual teacher has to inspire this uh, mood of surrender in the devotees, he has to teach them by his example. Also, uh, if we are soft-hearted and Krishna wants uh, from us to kill someone, so we have to do it because it's a higher principle, right? Or it's a cruel example, but um, if Krishna wants something from us, it doesn't matter what we are as a person. Well, we have to be very careful about these kind of things. When you talk about killing somebody, that's a very... <laughs> Special, you know, if you're a Kshatriya, like Arjuna is a Kshatriya and he's fighting a Dharma, a religious war, then it's all, but you know, anybody else, you know, there's nowhere. We see in the Kali Yuga, there's no killing. Lord Chaitanya was called, in Kali Yuga, you have to be merciful because everyone has fallen. The demon and the devotee is in the heart of everyone. You cannot kill people in the Kali Yuga. We have to change the demons and make them devotees. Yes, Maharaj, understood. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah, there are still three hands raised, Maharaj. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to clarify this uh, little bit, I mean, this uh, sloka which was uh, asked by Valmiki Prabhu. Um, uh, to stay in our own occupation uh, is because we are in the Kali Yuga and we uh, don't know what is our nature. And can we say that uh, we just stick to whatever our spiritual master said and instruct us and do it as a duty no matter no matter what and just stick our heart and mind and determine to do it yes that's very good yeah you do what your spiritual master tells you thank you Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have one more doubt Maharaj. Uh, this is again Shlok number 47, uh, which we were talking about. And uh, it says that um, um, that uh, then to accept another's occupation and perform it perfectly. So he's saying even though one may perform it imperfectly, he should do his own occupation rather than accept another's occupation and perform it perfectly. So basically, if a person is able to do the other occupation perfectly, doesn't that become his swadharma? <laughs> because swadharma is like you have a propensity towards a particular thing. So suppose he, what he is doing, but then uh, the other thing that he is doing, he is doing it better. So doesn't that become his swadharma? How to understand this, Maharaj? Well, we have to understand, you know, we have particular duties given to us. 
And so we, you know, some like you may think you can do kirtan better than somebody else, but you've been given some other service to do. So somehow that other person they're doing kirtan, but you know your kirtan is better than their kirtan. All right, and so you know some Krishna arranged. They've got that service. You've got your other service. Even though you're not so happy in doing that other service, we still do it. We have to see the hand of Krishna, that Krishna has arranged me to do this service. I don't do it very well, I can improve. I can improve my service, I can improve it. But if we, if we, if we, are, if we're not, you know, if we go into another person's service, then it creates a disturbance. You know, why you're coming here, I've got this service, this is my service, why you're coming here. <laughs> you know, we don't want to make trouble, we don't want arguing, uh, you know, just, you know, accept the plan of Krishna, that Krishna has put me in this service, let me do it. Even I can't do it very well, let me try and improve and do it better. And later on, if Krishna wants, Krishna will arrange me to get that other service. Just like there were some devotees, they were good artists, painters, you know, they could paint beautiful pictures of Krishna. But they were doing Sankirtan, they were going on Harinam Sankirtan and book distribution, sometimes cooking in it, but actually they're good artists. And so, you know, they would, they would just do their what service they were given, but then when they, some, later on they found out, you know, this person is really a good artist. So then, uh, you know, we, we need the artist, we need some painting, so then they, they bring him to do the art. But if they didn't need the artist, if they didn't need the painting, you know, just let him do Harinam. No harm. Harinam, you get purified. Okay, Maharaj, but then here it is they are particularly talking about Swadharma, our prescribed duties. And he's say, saying he, that doing one's prescribed duties is purifying. And it's difficult to identify one's prescribed duties. Uh, that is why I was asking. Because, well, the spiritual uh, master gives us a duty, right? Whatever duty is yes. given by the spiritual master, we take that. Swadharma. Our Swadharma is to serve Krishna. Yes. Whatever yes. position, whatever duties we're doing, it's not, you know, it's not eternal. We do it for a little while, we'll get another service after some time. It's not going to be forever. A real Swadharma is service to Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, Swarup Krishna Prabhu has a question, Maharaj. Okay. Hello, Maharaj. Maharaj, I knew, I, mean, I need to know that Srila Prabhupada wanted to establish Varnashrama Dharma in our society. Now, I am. I have always been wondering how Brahmanas is understandable, Vaishyas is understandable, Shudras are understandable, but how Kshatriyas can be identified and how can they be trained? Who can be the Kshatriyas in our society? Well, Kshatriyas. Who can be the Kshatriyas in our society? The, the administrators. The leaders, those people who are showing the example, who are very good examples in all the activities, then this is like Kshatriya. Somebody's the manager, they have to organize everything. That's also like Kshatriya. Kshatriya, they, they will protect others. Yeah. The, these different duties, we said, sometimes somebody may be, they may be a brahmana, but they, they may have a powerful body, so they can also give protection, they can do the work like a kshatriya. We see sometimes in our society, sometimes people who are leading preachers, they also have to do a lot of managerial work, they have to be leaders, and they have to be almost like a kshatriya to organize, they have to take that kind of role just to get things done. So, we're not practicing Varnashram. You know, Prabhupada said, you know, that's 
already kind of finished. We, you, you know, we can't bring it back. We can't bring it back. But if we can have like farming communities, you know, you have a farming community and then on the farm or some, uh, somewhere where we have our own community, then we can show them the model how a society was organized in the Vedic society. How there are Brahmanas and the Brahmanas will be around the temple and then the Kshatriyas are there and the Kshatriyas, their job is to, you know, like a king, they have to collect the taxes from the people. So they have to get them, bring in the funds to maintain the activities and, and to look after everyone, to take care of the needs. And they have to protect the, the devotees from the non-devotees, from the thieves and the dacoits who come to trouble the devotees. They have to give protection to the devotees. So whoever is able to do that, sometimes we will have devotees trained like that, military arts, they know martial arts, they know self-defense. So maybe when, like when Prabhupada was there, we had a few devotees who would, who could be like bodyguards around Prabhupada in case anybody came to try to tr trouble Prabhupada. We'd want to protect him. We don't want anybody coming, giving any trouble to Prabhupada. So keep a, some very uh, physically capable person there to protect Prabhupada. It's more like a, that's like a bodyguard, it's not really Kshatriya. The mood, but the mood of the Kshatriya is something like the king, like Maharaj Yudhisthira. He's the king, you know, he's the administrator and he's the perfect example. And he's taking care of everyone and encouraging people in their religiosity. So, sometimes you, you don't really get Kshatriyas very easily. Just like Brahmanas are rare, Kshatriyas are also very rare. But people can be trained. We have, a, we have schools for training Brahmins. There's also some plan to also train people for Kshatriya, to be Kshatriyas. Hmm. Thank you, okay. Hare Krishna. I think there's no more questions, Maharaj. Okay. So we'll stop here. We'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki.